Phil, it's lovely to see you here today to talk Thank about you. crossing lines. Um, for fans who know your work so well on many things, films and TV, but for Prison Break fans in particular, how would you compare crossing lines in your character in the show? Um, I have been asked about comparisons with the characters, and yes, they, both characters are police officers and incredibly good at what they, what they do. Both characters have a bit of a substance abuse problem. Um, so, but I really think the similarities kind of kind of end there. Uh, they they live fractured existences, but but they're completely different guys and from different places. And you know, FBI and a New York City cop that's about as different in the police world as you can get. I mean, they I think so. Uh, you know, they they are different, but they're they're cops, and that's the biggest. Um, similarity between the two of them. Now you mentioned the word fractured there, and I know um, from looking at your um, filmography and t uh, TV work and, uh, and having read on interviews as well, I know you love the kind of fractured characters that you play, and what is it that attracts you about them so much? Well, you know, they're, you know, they have flaws, and so flaws are, are human, and we all have flaws. I have a lot of them, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's, when scripts are well written, especially in in the world of television, which television is great scripts, I think you live or die on great scripts. And in the first two episodes of Crossing Lines, which is basically what I had to make my decision on whether I wanted to do the show or not, um, Ed Brunero wrote wrote a character, this character of Carl Hickman. I, by the end of two episodes, you know so much about his world and what went wrong and you know changed his life and sense of identity and losing his job and how does he handle this injury and does he take medication for it and that and these are all things of a, of a guy that had a, a life that was so together and you know just within a matter of a couple of years you know it's basically his life fell apart it really fractured and um so what does that give you it gives you all that stuff that make up you know makes up a real person and that is the ultimate thing, you know, I think in the creative journey, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, play somebody that's, you know, I want to play somebody who's real. And uh, when you get great things and great problems, it, it tends to make it, in my opinion, somebody that's real. And it makes it much more interesting for you and also for us, of course, as the audience. I mean, you mentioned his injury and Carl, of course, has been shot um, in the hand, hasn't he? I wondered how you went about getting used to that or how difficult or easy you found getting used to that, not being able to use it when you were well, on that, set. Uh, <laughs> only once in a while. Well, I have, I have a glove, you know. It's, it takes a lot, a lot of time to put on the special effects makeup for the hand. So there's only a couple of times we've actually seen mm -hmm. the hand. Uh, but I slide a glove on it. Once the glove's on it, it's, it's you know, I have a reminder that I have a glove on so I don't, don't use my right hand. Every once in a while, I'll reach out for a door and like, cut. You have to do that over. I just <laughs> I just picked up a glass with my, you know, my gloved hand. But, uh, but that's not the fascinating thing about the hand. The fascinating thing about the hand is that it's, it's a reminder of, a constant reminder, a character reminder of, 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 of an event and someone that created that event this person that I'm trying to find in the show, uh, it's it's a constant reminder. Just sliding on that leather glove tells me so much as the actor about a life that has been changed. That's the importance of of that. The physical thing is not it. It's 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 the mental journey. It's the emotional journey that one event had on one person's life. I'm wondering, you mentioned, of course, Prison Break before, and you're talking about that although they're very different characters in different shows, um, they've got that kind of forensic background, that forensic mind, these characters, don't they? I wondered how much of a forensic mind is that do you have in real life, or is it rubbing off you from playing some of these characters? Well, you know, you know not that it has anything to do with it, but I, I, when I graduated high school, I went to college, I have a bachelor's, I went to school for four years, I took criminal justice. I, I actually really wanted to be, like, in the FBI or something. Uh, somewhere in the middle of college, I, 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 I partied a lot. I had a great time. But that's a side <laughs> note altogether. It was Tell a us great more. time. <laughs> I, I can't believe it. Um, but uh, I made a life change switch of what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to be an actor. It didn't happen in high school. It didn't happen in college. I took a couple of classes. But, you know, so I've played so many of, of, of these guys and... What I could tell you is that uh, 
it's not that they're, you know, you know, that they can like, you know, see in crystal balls and that, you know, I think a great cop is someone that just has a great def refined skill set. You know, you, if you're really good and you really care about something and you work hard at it, you get really good at it. I think that's Mahone in Prison Break. He's really good at it. I think Hickman's really good at being a cop. You know, he knows the questions to ask and he knows the places to look. You know, everybody looks over here, but he looks over there. That's a good cop. I think that's not just unique to television. I think there are real people like that in the world that are that good because they're great police officers. So how did it help, for example, having someone like Ed Bonero, obviously he created the show, but he's an ex-cop himself, isn't he? Yeah, former Chicago police officer. I think the amazing thing about Ed is that, you know, this is a, this is a guy from the streets of Chicago who was, you know, a Chicago police officer and then one day decides that, you know, I want to write my stories and, and he's so good. I mean, he's a, an excellent writer. I mean, I mean, people come from all walks of life and do, do different things. And I think that is one of those examples of somebody, wow, police officer turns writer and is that good. Um, so he's, uh, you know, he, he comes from a place and he knows how to put it down on paper. Now tell me about filming, because you were filming in Prague, weren't you? And you were also filming in Paris and the south of France as well. Very nice places to be. No doubt, no doubt. But I think, I think Prague has been the, the, the jewel of it all. Um, and, uh, and going back there to begin this second season now. I, I, I'm not sure if I, um, if I would be in the show this year if it wasn't going back to Prague. That's how much I love Prague. Uh, so much so because this isn't sort of the sort of thing I'm, I live in California now. It isn't like I'm traveling an hour or two to go to some location. I'm traveling 10,000 miles. I, I wouldn't have done this if I wasn't going with my wife and, and, and my kids. So, you know, my little one's in school there now. I, I live in the Czech Republic. I live in Prague. I, I think of it as, as it is rapidly becoming like uh, a second home, almost equal to the first one. Wow, that's great to hear. Yeah, Fantastic. I love, I love, love the Czech Republic. And you enjoying the beer out there as well? They've got great Oh, the beer. Pilsner is just stupid good. I mean, I'm a red <laughs> wine drinker, and I, I, you know, I, I, I try to go to the gym every day. You know, I'm like, you know, I want a beer, but I, you just can't stop. I mean, it's. It's so good. It is good. Beer and Czech hockey. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> I didn't even like beer until I went to Prague. <laughs> right? I know. It's it's amazing. You got your Black Hawk Down buddy on on board as well, haven't you, Kim Coates? Oh, Kim Coates is. You know, <laughs> I I told the story many times, but when I was finding out about like how did this whole hand thing happen with Hickman, and Ed and Roller were telling me all about you know, well, there's this character of Genovese, and one day over lunch they explained like who Genovese was, and I told them right then and there. I just save yourself to just hire Kim Coates right now. So they were like, wow, yeah, we know Kim. And I'm like, I'm telling you, hire him right now. And they said to me, do you think he'll do it? And I said, he'll do it for three reasons. One, you have nothing to do with, and that's because I'm here. And we're hockey fans, and, we, and, and I've been telling him about, like, Czech hockey and drinking beer. So he'll come over for that. has nothing to do with you. Uh, you have to write him great scenes, or he won't do it, and um, uh, make it worth his while. And so they went to L.A. This was last year. And they met him when they were there. Coatsy was there a couple of months later. How cool, hey? Oh, it was the best. Are you kidding me? <laughs> the same I... thing happened in Prison Break, too. You know, I remember one day I was reading second, first season I was on Prison Break, and, and, and I saw this, uh, I, I read this breakdown of this character that comes on who's, who's kind of investigating me. I called up the creators and I said, get Coats right now. And they're like, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm shameless. I, I, on everything, I do it. <laughs> I read him like, you got to get coats right now. Hire him right now. I'm, I'm his agent. I told I him. I said, you might be better than Come on, I want, I want 10% <laughs> right now. Just keep bringing over. We're good. We're big uh, Napa Valley red wine drinkers. So I just, I tell him, it's just, just bring me nice wine. <laughs> Very it's good. I, I love it. I love, I love this kind of um, little exchange you've got going on. Wine for rolls. I love it. Now you mentioned um, there's already shooting season two, which is great to hear. Yeah. Um, how would you like to see your character developing and how would you like to see the show developing as well? You know, I, I, I love the character and I have all faith that, that the character will develop. I, I'm, I'm, my concern is, is, and it's not a concern, but uh, I love to see, see the show develop. I want to develop, uh, you know, the first season that, that you do a show, any show has growing pains. You know, you're figuring out, you know, what are you good at? What's 
certain things are better than other things. Uh, I'm happy to say after the first season, I really thought that the journey that the show took was great. I mean, we really came together in a way that pretty rapidly over 10 episodes. Um, uh, and a lot of that is behind the scenes stuff that nobody will ever know, like watching it, but, but I know. And I think that, you know, going into a second season, I just, you know, explore, explore the characters. Because I don't think people tune into police shows, uh, at least a, sh a show like this for sure. It's not really a procedural show at its heart. I don't think people tune in because they want to see the crime of the week. I think they want to see what these characters are doing with the crime of the week. Uh, and the more that the characters are explored, and, and it's not just a weekly thing, that there are through lines for all of the characters, and we do that. Um, that's interesting. And as long as we continue to do that, I think we've got something interesting to say. You mentioned behind the scenes, um, things going on there. What's your favorite behind the scenes story, or what's your uh, most surprising thing that fans would find out about the show? Um, you know, I'm, I'm always the worst at answering those. When people <laughs> say to me, tell me the, the most funny thing that happened behind the set. I don't know, I put like, I put like nine sugars in my coffee one day and I was like, wow, what the heck is that? I mean, I, I never know. <laughs> I never know. I never, I, to me that stuff is, I, I don't know if it's interesting. It's just what we do, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I'll come up with one of them. If I ever think of one, I'll call you. I'll say, I got one. <laughs> I've got one. I've got a great story. <laughs> Definitely, I'll hold you to that. Um, I wanted to just ask you a little bit about your film work that you've got coming up, or films that you've, you've recently wrapped. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, for example. How did it go? How was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle experience? Awesome. Absolutely awesome. I remember when my manager called me and said, I got a script, and I hope you like it, because if you do, you're leaving in two days to go to New York. And I'm like, wow, wow, tell me all about it. And he was like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I'm like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, wow, okay. Because <laughs> I have nieces and nephews, um, 10 of them, that are all within that age group. They all grew up in the 80s. Uh, and if you grew up in the 80s, that was the time of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And what I know about it, you know, just peripherally, is, you know, it always was, you know, Donatello and Michelangelo and Splinter and Shredder and... Uh, it always had sort of a bouncy cartoon sort of feel to me, which was great. It was what it was appealing. That's not this movie. This movie is, is live action. Michael Bay is producing it. And I've worked with Michael a couple of times. So that's a massive commitment to, you know, the visual. And uh, Jonathan Liebeson directing it. And it's, uh, it's, it's not like any Mutant Ninja Turtles thing you've ever seen before. It's... Uh, it's freaky. They're cool and they're mutants and they look awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's 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 tough. Cool. It's going to be really really great. Fantastic. Yeah. I cannot wait to see it. I mean, what was it like for you playing what must be one of the turtles' most iconic adversaries? Shredder. Yeah. Uh, well, I play a guy named Eric Sachs and we find out that Eric Sachs is somebody else too. Uh, and uh, I can't give away too much in the story, but I can tell you that who Shredder is in the telling of this Turtles is unlike any other telling of the story before. His connection and relationship to the Turtles is a bit surprising. Ooh. Yeah. And really, uh, it, it, for an actor playing it, it was like the backstory, is, it, which comes out in, in, in this film, is, is really, uh, really intriguing. I am intrigued. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I was too playing it. I mean, yeah, we we made some changes while shooting the film that I thought were just awesome. Cool. I mean, what what is it in terms of look? Can you tell us a bit about what? Uh, the look is, you know, you know, Shredder is dons himself with uh, armor, and uh, and that's who he is, and that happens in this in this story. Mm -hmm. um, it's the backstory on on how it all began with the turtles that. Uh, uh, the character of Eric Sachs has, uh, it isn't by chance that he knows the turtles. Ooh. Du, du, du. I can't tell you anymore <laughs> right now. I'm in trouble right now. Um, would you like to see maybe a, a sequel to that movie? Would you like to see a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2? Is there room for that or room for your character for that? You know, all of that really happens when in the success of the first one. Mm. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to do another one if the first one isn't any good. 
Do I think you're going to see another one? Oh, I think you're going to see a few of them. I do. Would we would we think would we see a return for you? Do you think? I signed a three picture thing, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We'll see what happens. <laughs> cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, you've got a couple of the movies coming up as well, um, that already uh, you've already wrapped on. Um, Saint Sebastian and the Homesman as well, both directed by um, actors who've turned directors, Danny DeVito and uh, Tommy Lee Jones, which made me wonder. How does experience differ for you when you're working with an actor who has turned director as opposed to an a, a director who hasn't acted before? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not really sure. That would be a specific case-by-case case sort of mm. thing. But I'd never met Tommy before. And to work with Tommy Lee Jones was... Uh, and, and, and I don't say this lightly or, or take this for as strong as you can make these words. It was, it was truly a... a, a an actor changing experience to work with somebody like Tommy. I, I never worked with anyone that I, I uh, he is a, a truly an original human being and, and, and tough and, and I really just wanted to find what he was looking for. Uh, you gotta kinda give it up when you're around Tommy. He is, uh, he is a force all his own and, and, and a brilliant human being. Um, and I was amazingly proud for for something that's you know I only worked on for a very short time uh, was was a, a life memorable experience for sure, and I think he's going to make an unbelievable movie, uh, a period piece from the mid 1800s. It was really something. As far as working with Danny, I met Danny 12, 14 years ago. I worked on a film called What's the Worst That Could Happen with Him. I worked on a film called Drowning Mona with him. I I I. I I love Danny. I mean, let's just put it, this is how Danny came to me for St. Sebastian. I was in in driving in New England, uh, seeing my son at college and the phone rings when I'm in a rental car driving 700 kilometers so I can go and say hi to my sisters in Buffalo, New York. And, and I'm driving down the New York State Thruway and the phone rings and I'm like, oh, right. And I, I like, hello, and he's like, hey, Bill, it's Danny, what's happening? Listen, I got this movie. Um, we, we have no money. I mean, no, listen, we have no money. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's cool, it's scary, it's freaky, it's, ah, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's like, I love, I love Danny. I'm like, Danny, I'm, I'm, send me this, I'm in. I'm, I, I didn't even read it, and I'm in. It's Danny, I mean, you're like, he, he gets all of these folks that he works with all the time. It's not his entourage. They all work on it, you know. Tosh, the DP, and and just these great people that you know. Uh, Jeffrey Curlin is one of the most amazing costume designers. You know, everybody does it. We, you know, we did it for nothing. I mean, nothing. I don't know, maybe a hundred dollars a day or something. It was. It didn't matter. It's Danny. What can we expect from Saint Sebastian then in your in your role in the film? Ah, uh, well, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy, spooky movie, and I don't know what Danny's. In, I think Danny always wanted to have it be something that he puts out online. Okay. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, it's taken a while because Danny came over here, he did a play, so he had to kind of put the, the film on hold and, and he's just put it together and there was a screening of it that I could not make because I was back in Prague uh, at the beginning of this season. So I'm not sure what the, you know, what the plan is for the movie, but uh, let's just, all I want to say about Danny is this, if my phone rings right now and he's like, Hey, I got this idea. It's cr I'm in. I'm in. Don't even. Uh, I'm in, Danny. I'm in. I'll do it for the rest of my life. I'm in. Brilliant. We love to hear that, Bill. It's been absolutely lovely talking to you. Thanks, Thanks so man. much for your time. Pleasure.